Okay. <laughs> I have no idea if this is going to work, but we're live again. And once again, Hopin is not allowing the presenter to join in and present. So I have uh, Dr. Jeff Smith here on Zoom, and I'm going to see if it'll allow me to, uh, to stream him in from Zoom again, uh, like we did earlier. Hopefully we won't have too many issues. If you have any trouble with the sound or anything, let me know in the chat box. And I am going to turn my camera off there, share my screen, and we should be about ready to go. I'll go ahead and get started. I uh, hope you're seeing my slides uh, on burnout resilience and Williams, my argument for the stronger canary. I don't remember burning out in medical school. I don't remember developing a lot of unsustainable or unhealthy habits, though. Or I do remember that. I do remember feeling the burn several times in practice, even though no one running the coal mine seemed to care. The most recent time was around 2010, shortly after I began experiencing worsening back and neck issues that had me thinking my successful career in the operating room might be limited. I remember cases in which I could feel my arm going numb while holding a fracture reduced or barely being able to tie my shoes. At the same time, I was growing deeply cynical from all the administrative BS and all the other issues of working in the coal mine of medicine. So I started researching exit strategies. What about becoming a coach? After reading Atul Gawande's book, Better, I was inspired to attend a coach training program and become a certified professional coach. During coach training, I learned a great deal about resilience and wellness that were much more sustainable. It turned out that coaching was a path to wellness and my stay in strategy. Today, I want to take the discussion of burnout beyond definitions and help you guys create some strategies to manage it both individually and on an organizational level. We're gonna focus mostly on the individual, which you'll understand better as I get in further into my presentation. I also hope you'll learn the critical aid practices that create sustainable physician success and understand why knowledge of these can empower you to create a sustainable and fulfilling medical practice. Hope you will learn some effective tools and strategies that balance out the negative stressors, frustrations, and challenges of becoming a great physician. And hopefully in the end, uh, I'll be able to get back on live with all of you and be able to listen to some of the conversation so that there's an opportunity to maybe create some plans that would condition you to manage burnout and moral injury and that adopt positive resilience and wellness strategies. Through coaching, I, I rediscovered my passion and my why. I do what I do because I want to make a major positive impact on other people's lives. Why am I here today? I'm here so that others don't have to go through what I went through alone. Why do you do what you do? And why should you care about physician wellness? So these next two slides kind of highlight a little bit about the coal mine and the concept that in healthcare, it's it's driven by a lot of principles and leadership and you know healthcare industry concepts. And while back there was the concept of the triple aim that included three of these and nicely over the last several years they've tried started to incorporate that concept of provider experience or provider satisfaction 
and that has become the, the fourth part of the quadruple aim. Interestingly, probably the pie looks not even as nicely as I showed here, where that provider experience or provider satisfaction even has that big of a pie, and that green part where the cost and value is being accentuated more. And really, I think most physicians are driven by the healthcare outcomes, um, and I think um, more and more so uh, by the patient experience. But these components of that 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 pie chart are what we're dealing with these days. And you and I are not going to change this overnight to where um, it's it puts enough emphasis on our wellness and our experience in medicine. So if that's the case, then how do we focus on the things that we can control? Well, let me give you a little bit more background about me. Uh, my disclosures are what I do. I put people back together after terrible accidents, and I guide these patients through their recovery. I also train the next generation of orthopedic trauma surgeons that do it better than I do. And as a certified professional coach, I collaborate with surgeon clients to support their well being and high performance. At Surgeon Masters, we use coaching strategies to move clients from where they are to where they want to be. I also try to be a loving, caring, hopeful, and improving parent, spouse, brother, and friend. How do I do all of what I do? I simply try to be my best self. And by researching and applying best practices to complex problems. But this is how I do it now. Before learning about these practices, I was intermittently experiencing significant burnout. I only knew how to train harder and keep climbing a never ending mountain of becoming and staying a successful surgeon. My training did not include learning to train better. Coaching and following the eight practices is helping me and many physicians train better. In my career, I wasn't trained for the medical career marathon and I was not being coached. Now, I know better. And as a coach, for example, I also get to work with a surgeon three time zones away was in his first two years of practice. He intuitively knew that working with a coach was a great way to prevent burnout and deal with the departure of his only senior subspecialty partner within the first six months of completing fellowship. Through case debriefings and many other coaching strategies, he has converted his perception of anxiety as being a negative into healthy anxiety to build confidence for taking on tougher cases, increasing practice and surgical efficiency, and even negotiating skills with his employer. Many in the healthcare system didn't and still don't appreciate how many things need, we need to juggle in our lives. Family, friends, and self-care are often last. So before coaching and learning about these eight best practices for how to succeed, I got really good at juggling one thing, my career. During my first five years in academic practice and 10 years in private practice, I learned to juggle better, but with way too much trial and error. Now I get coached. I coach myself and I coach others how to build a rhythm to be more focused in the various roles and relationships that they're involved in and much more. I could say that I'm a victim of mental and emotional abuse from the coal mine or a victim of moral injury. 
However, I don't choose victimhood. I seek a healthier way to manage my frustrations, my adverse outcomes, and my post-traumatic stress. We in healthcare need to be aware that mental wellness and the prevention of anxiety disorders, depression, PTSD, and suicide come, comes from an honest recognition that we are humans and we need emotional and peer support. So my spoiler alert for this presentation is that higher re resilience correlates with less risk and less symptoms. I'm not embarrassed to share my personal experiences and my burnout. Many of the most talented, strongest, smartest, and most passionate are the highest risk of burnout. One of my first and longest surgeon coaching clients felt comfortable enough at one of my first presentations on these subjects to raise his hand to share that he was experiencing burnout. He isn't doing what I told him to do because to coaches don't do that. Through coaching, he is making his choice to prioritize marriage and family over relocation to a different practice. He remains a favorite amongst hospital staff and patients, despite his challenge of not being offered partnership. What is burnout? Well, just based upon the definition of Maslach's and Maslach burnout inventory, it's a syndrome of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and decreased sense of personal accomplishment. And we want, let me even go back to that a little bit, because there's this whole debate these days about whether it's burnout, moral injury, uh, victim of abuse, and a, a toxic uh, training and work environment. But to me, I don't think it's as important about what we call it. And that's why I think it's really a lot about just moving forward and doing things that we can do to impact it. And again, if you're going to take shame and destigmatize mental health issues, my whole thing is destigmatize burnout. Like, I'm trying to be a little bit careful not to cuss, but I don't like, I think burnout's a healthy thing. When I'm, feel the sensation of burnout, it's telling me something's not aligned and I should uh, do what I can to realign what I want to do so that it, it it takes me to where I want to be. So if you look at it a positive, I don't think it uh, needs to have any of the uh, stigma that people may be assigned to it. And I think the thing that I want to share on the most positive side is my recovery. While some re research shows that greater resilience lessens the risk of PTSD, burnout and more, I've discovered that the challenge was not a lack of resilience, but rather a lack of positive resilience. And my recovery involves working on any of the eight practices of highly successful physicians. I simply try to be my best self and by researching and applying best practices to my complex problems or challenges. So I'm gonna kinda, I'm gonna go over these things because they're an overview. There's so many subsets to each of these things, but it's the eight practices of highly successful physicians. It's the eight practices of wellness. It's the eight practices of fulfillment. Like whatever you wanna call it, this can be applied to what you're trying to address and whether as Chase sort of described it when we were first talking about a prevention or if I don't actually think it's something that you can prevent, it's something that you manage, then um, you know, what is it we do that that is in the positive side? What builds resilience, what what uh, creates wellness, longevity, sustainability, whatever you're seeking. So think about what it is you're looking for and these are some steps to get there. And you'll help me apply it to the medical school side because there's certainly absolutely things relevant to that that are important. What it boils down to is it requires practice. Practice, practice, practice. Practice makes better. 
And so if you want to get better at anything, if you, if you want wellness, you need to practice wellness. So here, let's just kind of summarize and go over these eight practices. First is that passion for performance improvement. It's your why. What is your why? Why do you want to get better? And I can tell you that you're probably at a point in time where you're hopefully still know that. But there are certainly times in many physicians' careers where they've lost their why. They forgot why they even went into medical school in the first place. Um, hopefully that's closer home to you. But everyone, in my opinion, or not everyone, a lot of people in the system are actually trying to drive your why out of you. And some of the experiences in healthcare are you discover or hold on to your why. Uh, tap into it, think about it, and why do you want to get better? So it's a growth mindset. It's moving forward. Why do you want to get better? The reciprocity of roles and relationships is that give and take. And I can tell you that the medical school is a very hard time to maintain many other roles and re relationships other than being the student and being the best student that you can be. Where you have positive relationships, hold on to those, nurture those, because those will help you get you through. If you don't have those, seek out any positive relationships um, to maintain you through medical school. And then be sure that after medical school that you're growing and building the positive relationships. Attitude resilience. Are you a person that thinks that things is glass half empty or glass half full? And uh, for me, or what I would almost even say is it doesn't really matter where you're at, uh, that whether you're a glass half full or glass half empty person, I will just tell you that you can change it. And I think that the demise and creation of burnout, the, the things that take people away from fulfillment and satisfaction is continually providing more and more glass half, half empty, and that the things that build, the positive things that you fill your glass with, um, the way in which you look at your um, look at your glass or your measuring tool as to how to make it feel like it's half full or even more than full or overflowing are things that create that positive attitude and that positive resilience that I was highlighting earlier. And I changed. So I was a person that was a glass half empty a person. And in the last 10 years, I've been able to convert that. How did I do that? I practiced it. I practiced the positive attitude and building that optimism. And there are many areas of my life where I'm very optimistic. Have I done it everywhere? No, because these are all works in progress. And so the point is, is, Start the habits now while you're in medical school and build on them. Even if they seem like they're very small, that foundation, that principle is something to build on as you move through medical school and into your career. And then there's the uh, practice of communication with mutual understanding. And this is one where you're not, uh, there's too many things that, People have different opinions and views on, so you're not necessarily seeking mutual agreement. Uh, reaching mutual agreement is is actually a very challenging thing that we do and we work on, but it plot it requires actually uh, using all eight practices because it's one of those complex problems and, and big challenges. But seek mutual understanding, appreciate other people's viewpoints, other people's perspectives. And that's key because when I share my perspective and only mine, then you know it's not understanding where you're at. So it makes it much harder for me to just throw out or spew out a bunch of advice. Uh, whereas if I understand where you're coming from, then there's a greater opportunity to me help build you and help build uh, relationships, help build wellness for healthcare, help improve the coal mine. Then there's time life management using rhythm. The 
the key here is that I'm, you know, and this is where opinion comes in. I'm not a firm believer or I don't believe that work-life balance is, is uh, achievable. Um, and yet I find that working with uh, myself and many uh, physicians is that when they can achieve a high state of rhythm in their life, uh, that they feel a great deal of success and a great deal of fulfillment. And that is a sustainable situation. And so uh, that rhythm can be in a day, that rhythm can be in a week, that rhythm can be in a month, or that rhythm can be over years. So I can tell you that uh, did I, I clearly did not have balance in medical school. Um, was I in a rhythm in medical school? No, um, but that's because I didn't know it or understand it. Uh, but there were times when I was in my rhythm, when I was on my game, in a flow. Those are all similar concepts. So rhythm requires focus on the task at hand. Um, I think you guys earlier had a mindfulness presentation and hopefully they highlighted that a lot of this is the management of what you're doing and then and being in the now and practicing and re rehearsing your time life management using rhythm is a great way to actually accomplish that. Inspiring the shared goal. So again, these are things that are critically important in healthcare, critically important in the success of your career. They may even be critically important now, but I would say in medical school, uh, we feel so much as an individual silo, as an individual student. So wherever you can reach out to your peers and realize that when you all graduate, you're all achieving a goal. And it's not so much about the individual and that um, you need, we need to take that further and further into healthcare and medicine where we're trying to achieve those shared goals. Um, the one thing that is also subtle in this one is that you have to inspire yourself and where you lose inspiration, then that is where you lose the ability to keep going. And this practice is the complex problem solving through simplicity. And so, uh, you know, like I said earlier, there's many things I can just be my best self and it's that simple because I just do what I do well. Uh, but where I have challenges, where I have frustrations, where I have goals that may be hard to achieve, I have to break it down into its simple parts and I have to get uh, the baby steps. I have to build that momentum. Um, you can't solve cancer with one study. You need multiple broken down studies. You can't solve any uh, complex problem in without doing it and breaking it down into its parts. So where you can keep it simple and it could be that in the eight practices, the way you can make it even more simple is just work on one of them. And then I'm going to give you another clue as an idea of ways to simplify things as well. And then lastly, uh, the eighth practice is that energy for personal practice wellness. I'm hoping that after I, I give this pr presentation and depending upon the technology and also time available, uh, that we can have a little bit of Q and A so that we can highlight some of these examples. But um, wellness practices come in the basically three categories. Some people make it the four, and I think that's a very appropriate application. But it's basically your physical wellness, your mental wellness, and your emotional wellness, and definitely there's a, a spiritual wellness. That spiritual well wellness doesn't have to be religious. Uh, but there is a uh, component of that that is also very important. But if you just focused on the physical, emotional, and mental wellness, then you will be far ahead of the game. Uh, and so these are things that uh, manage burnout. It's that filling of the tank. I just somebody recently shared a great article from cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, and these are becoming more and more prevalent that people get more and more comfortable talking about these things of what is resilience. And the whole entire article has barely anything to do with grit, has very little to do with just toughing it out. It's uh, exercise, nutrition, sleep, 
uh, self-compassion, connection to others. And I think I even left out one or two in that article. But these are the things that I can share with you is that your learning of these concepts, when you catch one of those articles, read it. It's going to be just as valuable to you getting through medical school, and it's going to be just as valuable in your career to add those concepts of self-care into a sustainable uh, and fulfilling uh, career in medicine. And it'll get you through medical school, even if it's in different doses. So keep that in mind. So breaking it down into its simple components, getting better at anything, it requires baby steps. Take a little bit at a time. Just start somewhere. Boom, boom, boom. And it requires practice. I, if you want to, if you want any one of these things, whatever you're trying to succeed, you actually have to practice it. It doesn't just happen. There's nothing in medicine that you're learning that doesn't come from putting without the effort of learning it. And there isn't a skill that you're going to develop that doesn't take practice. Uh, and so every one of these things is another thing that you have to practice. And as you practice, you'll get better. And the key is if you read anything about um, the 10,000 hours or the concepts of becoming an expert, I would even just argue that to become proficient or expert in any skill set, it requires not just practice, but it requires deliberate practice. So on a, on a smaller scale, every one of these things is uh, your ability to reflect on where you're at and then assess what you're trying to adjust, set those goals. And as you create those goals, then you have to put those um, that plan into action. And so that's it's the intentional adjustment that you rehearse over and over and over again. I could even draw sort of a whole little cycle within here that you do the repetitions, repetitions, repetitions before you go back to reflection. Uh, but deliberate practice is the key, not just what I did initially, which was, you know, let it all happen. Let somebody else tell me what to do. Let me follow the lead. I didn't play as active of a role in that. The more active you are in this, the more deliberate, the more improvement you'll see. And here I have to go through my advanced buttons because I have this animated and it's got, uh, but if you notice with this cycle, you have to repeat it. And I do this with all sorts of things that I'm working on. Uh, I know clients will do this. Uh, the th a thing that I didn't mention earlier about the eight practices, uh, I don't think it really matters so much if you use that methodology or use a methodology. I think it's important that it be something that has uh, a basis for it by research showing that it works and that you that it be something that is uh, uh, adaptable because that that a practice is also is that adaptable to whether you're in medical school, whether you're in residency, whether you're in fellowship or in practice, maybe even in retirement. So use things, follow the leads and methodologies of things that you see that are working for others, but more particularly what works for you. So just to rehash my final key points about creating, uh, managing burnout uh, to uh, build resilience uh, to create wellness for you both now and in the future. But the most important thing in medical school for a lot of things is build that foundation. So you have to start with your component of reflection. So things that you want to uh, have an improvement in now, uh, reflect on those. Uh, set realistic, achievable goals things that can be done in the time frame. A great example of this is, is sort of that diet concept. So if somebody tells me, or if I told somebody, hey, I, I think it's reasonable to lose 10 pounds in whatever period of time, uh, plop that person in the medical school you know, or put the demands of so many things of them on medical school and in medicine, and that 
goal is almost instantaneously not attainable because there's so many drivers, so many pressures in every other way. Um, kudos to those that can achieve those things and, and, and that but most of the people that we're comparing ourselves to achieving certain goals are people that are either way further along or have very few other distractions um, and expectations on their life, um, which is in medical school. And then adjust intentionally. So that's, again, the key, like rehearse it, adjust it, evaluate your adjustments and keep swinging the bat, throwing the ball, um, doing whatever else other high performance people do, dancers, singers uh, that are getting better at something is the most successful do this. And this is the way that professionals can succeed. So I appreciate your patience with the technology and the fact that I'm doing this a little different than I was hoping. Um, I hope there might be a few minutes uh, for me to answer questions. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe I can either switch technologies to be involved in that or we'll figure it out. Chase will guide me. But uh, keep doing what you're doing. You got in the medical school, you're going to get through it and practice your best. And importantly, stay well. Dr. Thank Jeff you. Smith, thank you so much. I do think that there might actually still be a lag between our audio. So uh, transferring questions via this methodology might not work the best at the moment. Um, I think it depends on if you're using your headset or not too. We might be connected to, to two different platforms with two different speakers. But um, please feel free to come over to the participant side in the chat room. And anyone that has any questions can enter them in the chat. And uh, hopefully we can get Dr. Smith over to the chat room to answer your questions. Um, I think we are going to have to start loading up the next presentation since we had a lot of technical difficulties with this one, but we should uh, be good from here on out, I think.